welcome to this uh, new uh, symposium sponsored by Esther uh, on septic shock and COVID-19 as a dysregulated host response syndrome. Uh, we have uh, two exceptional speakers. Uh, we have Silvia De Rosa from the intensive care department of San Bortolo Hospital in Vicenza, Italy. And uh, we have uh, Professor Vincenzo Candalupi from the Western Piedmont University in uh, 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 the area of uh, Northern Italy. Um, we are pleased to have these two experts because they will enlighten us on the role of polymixin B hemoperfusion in septic shock, but also in COVID patients. And uh, I have uh, uh, to start, uh, uh, the pleasure to start uh, with Silvia De Rosa, who will tell us uh, about uh, the experience uh, with uh, polymixin B hemoperfusion in these patients. So Silvia, you can share your screen at this point and start your presentation. Okay, thanks Prof. Uh, I thank uh, Esther for inviting me. I will talk about endotoxic shock and COVID-19, the role of polymixin B hemoperfusion. That's my, that's my conflict of interest. And um, uh, I want to start my presentation with this question. Is the cytokine storm relevant uh, in uh, septic uh, uh, in septic shock. And uh, as we know, everything starts with an interaction between host and pathogen. From one side, we have um, a pro-inflammatory response. Um, uh, so partner recognition receptors recognize, and uh, um, we have a response against uh, pathogenic factors, PEMPs and DEMPs. We have a host response uh, leads to a cascade of intracellular uh, events. Uh, leading to cytokine uh, synthesis and excessive, uh, excessive uh, cytokine release. So on one side we have uh, from inflammatory response. From the other side, we have anti-inflammatory response with an increased susceptibility to secondary infection due to immunosuppression. Because we have an impairment of immune cell function from, uh, in the same time, we have apoptosis of T, B, and dendritic cells, and an increase on number of regulatory T cells. So inflammation is a necessary evil. So we have an insult, for example, the infection, triggers, PEMPs and DEMPs, and sensors, pattern recognition receptors, like uh, toll like receptors. So one uh, of PEMP is represented by endotoxin. Bacteria cell wall component, LPS, is one of the most potent immune activators then that gain prominence. And uh, we have uh, from this interaction as immediate results, a cytokine storm. So if it is true that there is a peak concentration hypothesis, is uh, important uh, to underline that uh, uh, we can use an intervention uh, to cut this uh, peak concentration of cytokines. And uh, uh, this intervention is represented by blood purification therapies, for example, uh, high volume eye filtration or the using of ICAT of membrane in CVVHD modality. But we can go um, uh, straight on endotoxin and remove uh, the endotoxin through hemoperfusion. So in uh, uh, 1964, uh, Onjama was, ja uh, was uh, reported uh, um, with editoria, in edit an editorial uh, um, with endotoxin shock. And uh, um, authors uh, underlined that uh, um, endotoxin shock was for the clinician a therapeutic dilemma. And uh, uh, at that time uh, was um, not available uh, a technique to, for removal or inactivation of causative agents. But now we have 2020 and um, from one side we can perform immunomodulation and removing uh, cytokines. From the other side, uh, close to source control, we can go straight on endotoxin removal. And we can do that uh, by adsorption, uh, that is an extracorporeal process in which molecules uh, dissolve in plasma and blood bind to the membrane structure or to other adsorbing substances. 
So um, I want to underline uh, um, that we have to focus uh, um, when we uh, talk about the desorption cartridge on device desorption capability uh, that represents the total quantity of a specific molecule that the device is able to absorb. Uh, in uh, commerce, we have a lot of devices designed for removal of endotoxin and or cytokines. But uh, in the same time uh, to measure, um, we, uh, we have a test and, uh, that we have to, to perform when we have high suspicion of endotoxic shock. And uh, the test is endotoxin activity assay. Uh, is a chemiluminescent BSA based on the oxidative burst reaction of activating neutrophils to complement coated LPS GM immune complexes. And uh, the range uh, is between uh, 0 0.6 to 0 0.9, and uh, um, that corresponds to endotoxin burden, that is amount of endotoxin extracellular free volume um, of 12.5 uh, and 50 microgram. This is important because according to endotoxin dose response curve, an endotoxin activity value of 0.9 corresponds to four nanogram milliliter. So if we consider a nadal patient with endotoxin activity of 0.9 and a blood volume of five liters, we have endotoxin burden around 20 microgram. But if we consider interstitial space, the volume is so high and the endotoxin burden is around 52 microgram. For value over 0.9, we have not determinable and the endotoxic concentration is over 50 microgram. So if we consider the device uh, for removal and the toxin, uh, the device at the sort of capaci capacity of toramixin is uh, 64 microgram. That is, if we can, as we can see in this table, is uh, um, more than uh, LPS adsorber and oxidis. And uh, uh, these uh, means that uh, when we have endotoxin activity, say over 0 0.9, we have endotoxin burden over 52 micrograms. So toramixin could be really useful in this case. The polymixin being immobilized cartridge was developed to combine the potent endotoxin neutralizing capabilities of polymixin B with extracorporeal immoperfusion. And what we can have is not only interruption of inflammatory cascade, but a decrease in the excessive systemic cost inflammatory response. We can have a decrease in the interaction between monocytes and the functional associated cell, but we can have a recovery from immunoparalysis in sepsis. We have a lot uh, of uh, um, uh, articles in literature, in literature. We have randomized control trial, but we have two data registries. We have EUFAS 2, phase one and phase two. So this is the first uh, uh, randomized control trial, the EUFAS study. It was um, uh, um, uh, a randomized and blinded study of 10 Italian ICU and uh, patient uh, enrolled were um, 64 patients. And uh, um, polymixin beam perfusion was compared with the conventional treatment. The absolute risk of death at 28 days improved significantly from 53% in the conventional therapy group to 32% in the polymixin beam perfusion treated group. But uh, um, the trial had the limits, uh, was not blind. The patient was selected uh, based on the evidence of safety shock from an intra-abdominal source and the uh, endotoxin activity assay was not measured. The second trial was at Abdomix and uh, was a French randomized control open label multicenter study 240 patients and uh, was analyzed 20 day mortality in patients with septic shock due to peritonides. And so standard care was compared, were randomized patients to standard care versus standard care plus polymixin B hemoperfusion. And uh, 20 days mortalities was for polymixin B um, group 28% versus control group 19.5% was not significant. But the trials uh, had a lot of technical issues and the observed composite mortality was substantially less than the estimate include in the sample size calculation, thus decreasing the power of the study to detect a difference. After we had the uh, Euphrates, Euphrates uh, randomized control trial, uh, it was a multicenter blind shame randomized control trial conduct, 
conducted in the 50, I see you in the United States and Canada, uh, a lot, um, a number of 450 patients were enrolled, where septic shock and uh, the endotoxemia was confirmed using endotoxin activity assay greater than 0.60. No difference was found in 20 days or cause mortality, but the trial showed that in some patients with septic shock, the burden of endotoxin activity was extreme. The endotoxin activity assay was over 0.9, so the protocol was uh, ch was changed, and uh, after the interim analyze, uh, analysis, uh, that uh, suggested lack or uh, effect in the patients with the MOTS of, uh, nine, uh, MOTS of nine or less, and those patients were excluded. After we had the postdoc anal analysis, and uh, um, the prevalent point was mortality at 20 days post randomization. Authors evaluate the impact of polymyxin B um, immoperfusion in patients with septic shock, and then the toxic activity measure was um, between 0.6 and 0.89. And um, so the mod modified per protocol population, we had a mortality at 28 days um, uh, with 26% um, uh, uh, um, for polymyxin B immoperfusion and 36.8 for shame and was significant. But uh, if we, uh, see, as we can see from this table, a lot of uh, study were performed, but uh, um, was a lack of measurement for some of endotoxin activity, say, and uh, the timing uh, was probably um, uh, too late because uh, the treatment was started after 24 hours uh, or for 48 hours for a lot of study. And uh, concerning length of ICU stay in dynamics, uh, there were no significant difference, but we have a little significant survival benefit. We have a lot of articles. And what uh, we do in our center with Professor Claudio Ronco is uh, to try to start the treatment uh, in a golden hour because we strongly believe that 24 hours uh, are so late, is, is too late. So um, uh, each patient come in emergency department, we perform an endotoxin activity assay, um, patient, septic shock patients, I mean. And uh, if uh, the endotoxic activity say is uh, over 0.6 or less 0.6 with the positive black culture, we have uh, a high suspicion of endotoxin shock and we start with polymyxin B hemoperfusion. But if there is a kidney failure, uh, we um, have a new approach. So we do sequential extracorporeal therapies. Um, uh, what we do is uh, try to support the kidney function with uh, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy and um, uh, sequential extracorporeal therapy in sepsis is a novel approach to the septic, septic patients with multi-organ damage in order to provide the critical patient with the most suitable therapy moment by moment. It is based on exp expert multidisciplinary team as we have in Vicenza. But uh, uh, it is important to have a registry and EDOFAS to study, EDOFAS to registry is a, an effective example showing that a multi-center registry might be useful in categorizing the clinical use of a specific extracorporeal blood purification in the real clinical context and identifying clusters of patients in which the treatment may be more effect effective. Uh, from this registry, I took 20 patients uh, between May 2019 and 2020. As we can see here, 70% um, of patients were male, and the median age was uh, 71, and 50% uh, of patients uh, was not surgical patients, and 40% of these patients had community-acquired pneumonia. Um, uh, the substitute score was the median substitute score was um, 71.5. What, as we can see here, uh, we have a, a decreasing of vasoactive inotropic score um, uh, uh, from T0 uh, uh, until T120 hours um, minutes, and uh, we have a decrease in sofa and in lactate, in lactate. And we have a decreasing in endotoxin activity as we can see here, when the, um, uh, the ICU mortality was 30%, the hospital mortality was at 35%, so not so high. 
Concerning the use of polymixin beam of infusion in COVID-19, it is important to understand if a cytokine storm is relevant in COVID-19. And um, we don't know exactly. We know that probably the linkage of cytokine storm to COVID-19 may be nothing more than a tempest in a teapot. We have no so high evidence. But we know that uh, some of the patients come in emergency department with a COVID-19 infection, they can have uh, um, uh, digestive symptoms with respiratory symptoms, or they can have digestive symptoms without respiratory symptoms. So um, a lot of patients can come with the gastrointestinal symptoms and the viral RNA was uh, detected in phages. So we can have uh, gastrointestinal symptoms during hospitalization, and uh, so um, it could be that uh, there is a potential transmission route and target organ of SARS-CoV-2. Um, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein binds to LPS and boosts inflammatory activity. So we can have direct infection of the good mucosa. We can have decreased antibacterial defenses. We can have an increased mucosa permeability, bacterial translo translocation, and systemic leak of endotoxin. So we have to be careful because uh, this kind of patient can have uh, around seven or eight uh, day, uh, days in ICU, in ICU, a superimposed infection. So um, we have um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to be careful because this patient uh, can uh, have uh, endotoxin activity more than 0 0.6. So we have to measure and uh, as uh, this panel of experts suggests, we have to use polymixin B hemopiffusion in the early phases to provide endotoxin absorption and should be used for two subsequent uh, days. If cytokine relief syndrome is present, uh, this treatment should be followed by methods for cytokine absorption and if organ support is required, CRT should be implemented in the conjunction or afterward. This confirmed by um, acute dialysis quality initiative consensus. And uh, um, we need uh, uh, trials and we need the registry. And uh, again, from UFAS2 registry, we took five uh, patients, COVID-19 uh, patients. We apply in our center the flow chart I showed before. And um, our patient had the sub two around uh, uh, equal to 6.8 medium, medium value. A 20 day status, uh, um, four of these five patients were alive, but hospital dis discharge status of one of these patients dead. So we have two dead and three alive patients. What, as we can see here, uh, we have a, a decreasing of the active neurotropy score we have a decrease in lactate, lactate and so far. We have a decrease in the toxin activity assay. So to conclude, in a comprehensive approach to endotoxic shock treatment, the evaluation of kidney infarction, vasopressor requirements, and endotoxemia, together, together with the source control and antibiotic therapy based on the time from sepsis diagnosis may have a role to personalize the treatment for each specific patient. The dynamic monitoring and prescription could further refine the treatment personalization adequately responding to the criteria of precision medicine. Thus, not only a specific treatment could be provided for every single patient, but even a more specific treatment shall be provided for every moment that patient has a particular need during his or ICU stay. So polymixin beam of perfusion is a safe blood purification therapy to be considered for management of unresponsive endotoxic, endotoxic shock, resulting with clinical benefit for patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia. Uh, you have uh, somehow tackled the problem uh, from the point of view of the endotoxin and the absorption uh, mechanism. And I want to point out that uh, you stress the concept of the golden hour as a very important issue because not only we need to identify the patient, but we need also to identify the right time for the uh, uh, intervention. Uh, at this point, I would like to ask uh, Vincenzo Cantaluppi 
to somehow complement this presentation, including the concept and the role of the membrane as another transport mechanism that can become uh, a, a crucial uh, element in the, uh, let's say, overall treatment of the septic AKI patient. So Vincenzo, please. Thanks, Claudio, and thanks to Esther Torai for the kind invitation. This is uh, my agenda today. The first part will be on sepsis and COVID-19 associated AKI, some epidemiologic, experimental, and clinical evidences. And the second part will be on potential clinical intervention, obviously focusing on dialysis membrane. The epidemiology, the importance of AKI in hospitalized patients uh, is emphasized in this uh, slide from the AKI advisory group of the American Society of Nephrology. You can see here that about 20% of hospitalized patients develop AKI and 1-2% AKI requiring dialysis, often in a clinical setting of multiple organ failure due to sepsis or septic shock. But these are not only American data, it was Italian data with the project group of the AKI of the Italian Society of Nephrology. We, we observe similar uh, percentage of AKI in our hospital, about 18% of hospitalized patients, differing in class one, class two, and class three according to the KDGO criteria. And you can see the increased rate of mortality from no AKI, AKI stage one, stage two, and stage three. And obviously these are mainly due to sepsis as first cause of AKI. Looking to pathophysiology, we know that the uh, host response to infection is uh, a part of uh, uh, different uh, inflammatory mediators. So the so-called damage associated molecular patterns, DAMS, or pathogen associated molecular patterns, PAMPs, such as endotoxins, uh, Sylvia showed some minutes ago. And we know that the, uh, the damage of the kidney is not only due to tissue hypoperfusion, but to a direct toxic immunologic effect of this mediator on the kidney. As suggested by John Kellum and others, PAMPs and DAMPs can be freely filtered by glomeruli reaching the tubular lumen and uh, inducing damage of tubular cells. But we can also have microvascular derangement, microthrombosis, endothelial cell injury, and again, a loss of nutrient uh, oxygen coming to the tubular epithelial cells. So we have two targets, the endothelial cells and the tubular epithelial cells. As we showed some years ago, with a simple experiment in the lab, taking the plasma of patient with sepsis and incubated tubular epithelial cells with this plasma, this plasma is are able to induce apoptosis. This is DNA fragmentation, the activation of caspases, and apoptosis was correlated with the low molecular weight proteinuria seen in the patients and with other marker of tubular damage, such as fractional expression of sodium and or potassium. So plasma septic patient contains pro-inflammatory and pro-apoptotic uh, factors. Sylvia talked about the importance of endotoxin in this multiple organ failure, including AKI. And obviously, if you look to the kidney, in particular to tubular epithelial cells, LPS can bind to the door like receptor for uh, generating local inflammation and oxidative stress. But endotoxin may also interact with leukocytes and other circulating cells, inducing a release of cytokines and other inflammatory mediators that can reach the kidney as well as other organs. In particular, these cytokines, TNF-alpha, fast ligand, can interact with specific counter receptors present on different types of cells, inducing apoptosis. And this was reported in the kidney, but also in the liver, in the lung, in the heart. And it is probably at the pathophysiology basis for the immune dysregulation, immunoparalysis in sepsis. So uh, to summarize this part, the inflammatory mediators can lead to alteration of the tubular cells, mitochondrial dysfunction, loss of polarity, inflammatory inflammation, so in increased lymphocyte adhesion and necroapoptosis. In uh, endothelial cells, another important uh, component is the activation of the complement cascade. In this experimental model of sepsis in baboon, uh, you can see here that the activation of the complement cascades uh, is associated with the development of AKI. And from an histological point of view, you can observe here in the kidney of the animals uh, the activation of the complement. This is the membrane attack complex, the C5B9, present in uh, the septic kidney. 
And similar findings were observed in COVID-19 patients. And this is an elegant study on the New England Journal of Medicine clearly demonstrating the presence of uh, genetic viral materials in the kidney, in, in, in tubular epithelial cells, in podocytes, and obviously in uh, endothelial cells. If you look at the endothelial cells, SARS-CoV-2 can enter the cells through ACE2 receptor, induce inflammation, releasing a different kind of cytokines, but also inducing a procoagulant state, so the activation of coagulation and the activation again of the complement cascade, as I previously described for sepsis. So we can say that COVID-19 is a sort of thromboinflammatory disease as reported in sepsis with the induction of microthrombosis. And we have to do the sort of work to the knife against this thromboinflammation, uh, trying to regulate the, uh, co the coagulation and the complement cascade. And uh, as we recently reported in the Acute Disease Quality Initiative work group, uh, summarizing the uh, mechanism for AKI during COVID-19 can be due to direct viral effects uh, such as endothelial injury, coagulopathy, complement activation, inflammation, but also to indirect effects such as fluid management, mechanical ventilation, nephrotoxin, and the sovereign infection of uh, sepsis or bacterial sepsis. So we have uh, this uh, cytokine storm and this uh, quite complex, it's not only cytokine, but we have different synchronous mediators and effectors. The activation of complex protein systems such as complement and coagulation, dumps, pumps. So we have a plethora of inflammatory mediators and obviously extracorporeal blood purification technique may act on these uh, uh, inflammatory mediators. So coming to the second part of my talk, uh, what, what uh, blood purification can uh, help uh, us in uh, the treatment of septic AKI. Sylvia uh, talked about uh, the importance of LPS and the uh, relevance of using polymixin B hemoperfusion. I, don't, uh, I, I was only to underline that uh, polymixin B hemoperfusion is able to reduce LPS and also some of the cytokines that Sylvia showed in her presentation, such as TNF alpha. And we can observe a decrease uh, of the SOFA score and of the rifle, so a, a sort of protective effect on AKI. But when we have this cytokine as proposed by our chairman some years ago for the key concentration hypothesis, if you have AKI, we have an increase of 100, 1,000 fold of the different inflammatory mediators in the bloodstream. And the nephrologist and intensivist look at the dose of dialysis. This is one of the last randomized clinical trials, the UR trial in the French ICU, um, comparing two different uh, dialysis doses, uh, so 30 against uh, 70 milliliters per kilogram per hour of dialysis dose without no difference in uh, outcome. And we performed uh, some uh, cytokine assay on the patients on UR with uh, Patrick Honoré, and you can see that there is a decrease of these uh, cytokines in the first phases, but then all the cytokines, the NF alpha, fast ligand, are able to increase again in the plasma. So probably we need a, a sort of third dimension in our dialysis model, adsorption, uh, adding to diffuse and the conversion. And we have different membranes. This is something that nephrologists know from a long time. This is uh, an article from uh, the nephrology group in Ghent uh, showing the similar results of what we observed in the UR. So at first a decrease of uh, all these cytokines and then an increase until you change the membrane, you change the filter. And looking at the mass absorption, so calculating the mass absorption and the mass transfer, you can see that the majority of the cytokines are removed by, by absorption and not by convention. And uh, obviously we have some membrane with uh, enhanced absorbing potential such as polymethylmetacrylate, TMMA. This is a proteomic analysis from plasma patient with end-stage renal disease, clearly indicating the removal of a high number of uh, molecular toxins. And this is something that uh, is also observed uh, in the acute uh, setting. We know that the PMMA membrane can, can reduce the uh, circulating levels of different cytokines, such as TNF, alpha, and IL-6. And uh, again, from the chronic point of view, from the end-stage renal disease patients, we observe in the multicenter 
uh, trial in Italy a decrease of this molecule, soluble CD40 ligand, that is uh, associated with cardiovascular mortality in chronic kidney disease patients, but is also an important biomarker of outcome, worst outcome in sepsis. So uh, to come to the end of my presentation, I want to show you some uh, experimental data on uh, in, uh, in experimental swine model of sepsis-induced AKI. And uh, the principal investigator of the animal studies is Giuseppe Castellano in Foggia, together with Tino Gesualdo in Bari, our chairman, Claudio Ronco Vicenza, and myself. Uh, the experimental uh, study is very simple, the infusion of LPS uh, and the start uh, of uh, an hemofiltration using PMMA versus polysulfon membranes for seven hours with the surfaces of the animals uh, at uh, 24 hours. As you can see here, PMMA induced an increased survival of the animals uh, in comparison to LPS-treated animals. And you can also observe an increase of urine output in PMMA-treated animals and an amelioration of the keratin serum creatinine levels. This functional protection is also observed at the histological level, where LPS in uh, hematoxin in staining, you can see the presence of uh, an infiltration of inflammatory cells in the tubular interstitial parts of the kidney and a significant decrease of this, inflammatory, in, this inflammation in PMMA-treated animals. Not only inflammation, but you can also see that LPS induced microthrombi in the glomeruli, so damage of the endothelial cells, and also the enhancement of the triggering of fibrosis, as shown by Masson from staining. And you can see again that PMMA exert a protective effect on the formation of microthrombi and fibrosis. Since uh, uh, we, uh, another important point uh, is that uh, PMMA seems to abrogate uh, tubular senescence in tubular epithelial cells. Uh, this is the staining, the immunostaining for CLOTO. CLOTO is an important protein to inhibit senescence. And so the so called process of epithelial to mesenchymal transition and the development of fibrosis in the kidney. You can see here that in healthy animals, uh, CLOTO is uh, preserved. LPS reduces CLOTO, but PMMA is able to maintain the stain for CLOTO in the tubular cells. These are to cause to uh, evaluate this, uh, the uh, possible participation of the complement cascade. Again, with Giuseppe Castellano, we recently published a paper in which we observed that the activation of the complement is able to induce tubular senescence in AKI. And so we investigated the complement system in, this, uh, uh, in, in our animal model with, uh, in, in, uh, in pigs. And you can see that the treatment in, with hemofiltration with PMMA significantly decreases, and surprisingly, both classical and alternative pathway of the complement uh, cascade. And this is also observed in uh, at histological level. You can see here the immunostain for pentatisrin free in the kidney in LPS-treated animals that was significantly decreased when uh, animals were treated by PMMA hemofiltration. So a reduction of the complement cascade activation in the kidney and also uh, as using the microarray profile, the gene transcription model, you can see here how the gene transcription profile is completely different from LPS treated animals and PMMA treated animals in presence of LPS confirming that PMMA is able to block or at least to limit the activation of the complement cascade. So coming to conclusion, I see, uh, I hope to have demonstrated the importance of the membrane in sepsis associated API. We have a plethora of different mediators. And, and again, the sequential therapy due to the, uh, uh, the better biotechnology uh, technique that we have at disposition. So we can have the removal of, uh, of LPS by polymixing BMO perfusion, and we can add the PMMA membrane to get rid of a different kind of cytokines and to reduce the complement activation. This uh, is probably due to the sort of protective effect of this extraporcoda blood purification technique in the pathogenic maintenance of AKI and probably of multiple organ failure. But we can also say that these extracorporeal blood purification techniques induce a sort of immune homeostasis. We try to restore a sort of immune homeostasis lost for the septic processes. So using the right biomarker, as we observed in the, uh, in the previous presentation, we can say that today we, we can use uh, 
specific extracorporeal blood purification technique for the right patients at the right moment, or if you prefer, for the golden hour. Thanks for your attention. And thank you very much for uh, your presentation, which, as I mentioned before, complements uh, what uh, Silvia has told us before. Now, I have a, a special question to both of you. Um, as you know, uh, there are uh, people that are skeptical about the use of extracorporeal blood purification therapies, uh, uh, you know, for sepsis and in COVID patients, and there are believers. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we had a discussion with uh, Professor Antonelli, with uh, Professor uh, uh, um, Stefano Romagnoli, we had discussion with Peter Pickers and many others. And at the end of the story, I must say that uh, uh, Adki has published a very prudent but stimulating paper recently in JAMA saying that uh, these are certainly the forefronts of uh, potential therapies for sepsis and for COVID-19. So what is uh, um, your position uh, in terms of current evidence uh, and the possibility to generate further evidence beyond the rational and the pathophysiological rational of this therapy. Silvia. So I strongly believe that we need the training. So people should be trained by expert people, expert centers. So we have uh, obvious evidence that are not so strong but uh, the problem i think is the training the problem is uh, the the use of blood purification therapy from people so honestly i think that uh, experience should uh, should be you know uh, should increase uh, uh, between those kind of population i i, I don't know if i i do you, you, you understand what I mean? Vincenzo, what is your... I mean, all, all the findings that we have for COVID-19 patients come from the previous experience for septic patients. And uh, obviously, not only including extracorporeal blood purification techniques, but also the use of uh, uh, drugs or the, the inhibition of the coagulation and the complement cascade issue. I'm sure that uh, uh, we have to follow, as in sepsis, uh, the pathophysiology I try to, 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 to talk about, because uh, from a pathophysiology point of view, uh, we have a, a, a clear indication of treating patients. So, uh, there are, you, you know, Claudio, there was a strong uh, debate about uh, the levels of the cytokines in uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, and, uh, okay, maybe that we don't have uh, the same uh, circulating levels of cytokine release syndrome of RBS in course of sepsis, but uh, I'm sure that we have uh, some uh, increase of the inflammatory mediators uh, in COVID-19 in respect to healthy people. And so I don't believe that uh, the, the famous single bullet using a monoclonal antibody is directed to these cytokines on uh, uh, another cytokines may be helpful in this situation. I strongly believe in uh, the development of new antiviral treatment, including uh, monoclonal antibody directed to inhibit the entry of the viruses in the, in the target cells, obviously, and the vaccination for COVID-19. This is true. Probably the, the uh, blockade of the coagulation of the complement cascade is true, but uh, uh, we know from sepsis, we know that we have no indication for using an extracorporeal blood for occupation for sepsis. But I strongly believe there is a rationale because we can block some of the uh, different uh, activities that we have. And the last thing, I think that we have not, uh, we have to care not only of the cytokine, of cytokine profile, but we have to perform a better immune phenotype of this patient. That is the same thing of sepsis, because we have to look not only at cytokine levels, but to cells, to the expression, to the quantity and to the quality of cells that express HLA, the iron monocytes, you know, the activation of neutrophils and so on. 
Yeah, I think you uh, actually hit the nail exactly on top of, uh, of the of the of the problem. In fact, I think that we we need to better characterize the patients, and for this we need the better biomonitoring. Uh, endotoxin assay is useful. Probably cytokine measurement once uh, upon a time is not so useful. We might need to have a better sensitive and specific measure of inflammation. Then we need to refine our endpoint for studies because if we put mortality as an endpoint, uh, we will never achieve the evidence. And finally, we need to uh, know very well the timing of our intervention, stressing the point that uh, Silvia has made about the golden hour. I think that considering the results we had in severely ill patients, we have noticed a perfect restoring of the uh, hemodynamics in this patient within a few hours. So if even this is the result, uh, this gives time to the intensivist to act with uh, uh, corticosteroids or other therapies and so on. So I think that it's useless to discuss about the utility of extracorporeal therapies as there is no evidence and not do the same for other therapies pharmacologically approaching the patient. So I think we need to work together, uh, putting together all the means possible to treat these patients. Well, uh, I think uh, we are getting close to the end of this uh, session. And uh, I would like uh, simply one message uh, of 30 seconds from both of you about uh, the topic that you have presented. Silvia, what is the key message that you want people to take home? Yeah, try to be faster. There is a golden hour in a septic shock patient, so we have to respect it and we have to be faster to recognize this kind of patient and to treat them if you want to have good results. And, and if you consider a golden hour, you must say that if you have a sequential extra Exactly. So you have to consider that uh, you uh, can have a kidney failure and after so hemoperfusion, you can apply all the kind of treatment to support the organ. So a golden hour and sequential therapy are really important for them. Excellent. So there is a golden hour for each treatment, even though the same patient uh, uh, is treated with different therapies uh, sequentially. Uh, Vincenzo, what is your key message? My key message is that uh, different extracorporeal blood purification technique, or if you prefer sequential therapies, may interfere with the pathogenic mechanism of sepsis and COVID-19 associated AKI. And from a nephrological point of view, this message to block API may be also a limitation of a development of chronic kidney disease, a chronic organ, or chronic damage in other organs. Yeah, I think that uh, the possibility to uh, specifically modulate the immune response uh, is probably the best approach for the extracorporeal therapies, according to the old uh, peak concentration hypothesis that we put together uh, many, many years ago. Okay, with this, I thank you very much for joining today uh, uh, a symposium on uh, septic shock and COVID-19 and the role of uh, uh, treatments for the dysregulated host response. Let's go on uh, with uh, our scientific session of the Vicenza International Course. Thank you very much to the speakers.